Welcome to Humanizing Healthcare. Each month, we talk with innovators and thought leaders who are working to make healthcare experiences more compassionate, emotionally engaging, personalized, and rewarding for both patients and care providers. I'm Chris Malone, and I'll be your host for today's discussion. As co-author of the award-winning book, The Human Brand, How We Relate to People, Products, and Companies, as well as founder of Fidelum Health, I am passionate about inspiring loyal patient and care provider relationships that foster longer and more fulfilling lives for everyone. It's a topic of great interest for me. For those who have joined the live broadcast of our program today, we'll be taking questions from listeners near the end of today's discussion. So be sure to use the chat button on the Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen to send us your questions along the way. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Thomas Howell, Assistant Medical Director of Patient Experience at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Howell is also a practicing OBGYN physician outside Minneapolis, Minnesota, and has been for over 30 years. And please join me in welcoming Tom to the program. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. So to uh, get us started, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Mayo Clinic? I have been involved in patient experience for now it's about 12 years. So kind of at the, the beginning of that for us and really passionate about that. And the the one thing that I've ever went home and said, hey, I'm thinking about taking this on, that my wife said, yeah, you should do that. That's what you're, you're about that. So that would be a good role for you. Otherwise, she's like, really, do you have time for that? Um, mm. But um, not very good at saying no, I guess. So I've been involved with that and watched the evolution of that uh, here at Mayo Clinic at, at both the enterprise level and locally in our community practice. I'm also currently the chair of the OBGYN department for the community practice. So that's that's my administrative piece. And then I'm still very much a practicing OBGYN, catching babies and doing gynecology surgery and taking care of uh, women's health needs, which has been so, super rewarding. So they've been keeping you rather busy, it sounds like. Yeah. And so, you know, if you can tell us a little bit, you know, the story of how you chose, you know, a career in healthcare. Where, where did it start for you, I mean, given where you are now? Well, um, where I ended up probably makes sense. I'm the oldest of 10. So as I was growing up, I, you know, my mother was either pregnant or becoming pregnant probably most of my life Wow. Um, as a kid and had thought about different career paths, psychology. I was a psychology major at Arizona State and then um, said, you know, it'd really be interesting. And we had a family friend who was a pediatrician. So I was very convinced as I entered medical school that I was going to be a pediatrician. I set up my rotations to optimize that opportunity and um, did all my surgical stuff on the front end, figuring I would get good at doing third year rotations and really shine in pediatrics. And as I got more into the surgical specialties and especially OBGYN, really found that I had an, an aptitude for that and really loved that, liked having interaction with patients, but also being able to do surgical procedures. Um, really liked the acuity of OB when stuff happens. You know, you, it's, it's an emergency then, but most of the time you take care of it and things end up okay. And so that's where I, uh, where I landed and it's worked out great. Um, I think it's what I was meant to do and it's been a very satisfying career. Well, it, it's very interesting to me that you had an undergraduate degree in psychology. I think we're gonna end up kind of drawing on that a little bit during a discussion today. So, um, you know, over the past few years, it seems like there's been this growing interest in the idea that healthcare needs to become more human. Kind of on the one hand, though, you've got folks like the Arnold P. Gold Foundation that's been promoting humanism in healthcare, which they define as compassionate, collaborative, and scientifically excellent care. They've been promoting that since the early 1990s. And then similarly, you've got folks like the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care, which was also founded in the 90s. And so on, on one hand, these are not entirely new ideas, but then I think more recently, you know, the critically acclaimed book, Compassionomics, which is advocating for the importance of compassion for patients, care providers, and even clinical outcomes. And now if you look around, it seems like the word human is kind of popping up everywhere we look in healthcare. You know, NRC has their human understanding focus and Press Ganey recently had their human experience conference. And so it kind of begs the question, kind of what's all this fuss about humanness in healthcare does healthcare really need humanizing? What, what's your take on all of it? Well, I think that we really have gone through 
a, a journey and as the scope of information and as the learning becomes more and more, you know, when I was in, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was in medical school, there were probably 20 antibiotics. Now there's, you know, 20 first generation cephalosporins. I mean, it's just crazy. So with that comes the need for more technology with the ability of technology to do things comes adopting that technology. But as we adopt technologies, there's a risk, right? There's less direct interaction. And we replace, walk down the hall and ask your specialist friend a question with going online and looking it up or sending them an instant message or emailing people. Mm -hmm. So we've lost a lot of that human connections. And I think that we miss those connections because people are pack animals. And at the same time, we've almost made adopting the technology the goal. Mm -hmm using the technology. And, and I think we're trained in medicine really to, to consider things in either or terms. So that's a differential diagnosis is a list of potential things this patient could have and what might those be. And then you start eliminating them, right? It's either this or that. Okay. If it's not this, then what does that mean? And there, if I can, there's a brief personal story that really drove this idea home for me and shifted my thinking a little bit around the whole point of experience and what we're doing in healthcare. Um, so just take a couple minutes, but my child one and child five, two of my boys and my wife and I were on a ski trip. And that night I had talked to my parents, my parents live in the Phoenix area. And my dad said, well, I'm, I'm going to the hospital because I'm having some trouble um, reading some stuff. I'm supposed to have cataract surgery, but they said, gee, it sounds like you might be having an event, like a ischemic event, maybe a small stroke, go in and get checked out. Well, they, they checked him out. They kept him overnight. I'm like, ooh, that's not good. But they were going to watch him. And then the next morning, he's going to have um, the, they're going to come in and go over his test results. So 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, where I was, 8 o'clock where he is, my sister, who's a nurse, is sitting there with my mother. And we're all on the phone. And the doctor walks in and says, I'm Dr. Johnson from neurosurgery. And I said, Ooh, neurosurgery, that's not good. And she basically said, you have a tumor in the middle of your brain. I couldn't operate on it. It would kill you if I did. This is probably going to be a terminal event for you. And then, you know, there's a whole, okay, send the ski stuff back. We'll fly to Phoenix, get stuff arranged, talk to a couple of people that I knew in, um, at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. So we got my dad in two days later to go see two very great specialists, a neurosurgeon and a neuro-oncologist. So people that really specialize in a sub, sub, sub specialty of oncology issues. And when we went there, both of them were excellent, very competent, way smarter than I am. But their questions came down to, do you want us to help you be comfortable or do you want us to try and prolong your life with some experimental treatments? And in that moment, I thought, that's the wrong question. That's how we're trained. The right question is, Mr. Howell, tell me about what you care about. What are your priorities? Help me understand you, and then we can talk about what makes the most sense going forward. And I know what his priorities were. We had talked about these things. I can still rattle them off. And it really guided his treatment and his journey um, through this illness and then eventually his death. Um, but that was really one of those aha moments on we are asking the wrong questions of our patients and our staff and approaching this differently from a more purpose driven humanistic what's your big why standpoint is a much better way to do this got it and what are the consequences if you think back about that experience and how that blunt news that dr johnson delivered without, you know, much consideration, what was the consequence? What was the impact on your dad and your family? The fact that it was kind of delivered in that way? Well, I think it was, you know, he, he said, well, okay, it is what it is. You know, I, I guess I go figure out what I'm going to do. And then as we went to uh, Mayo and Phoenix, the next level of thinking about peeling that onion back was it shouldn't be about either or choices. You know, we, we get mm -hmm. ourselves in boxes. And I think with technology, we do that, right? We're, it's either this technology or that technology, instead of thinking about how we're going to reconfigure how we care for people and what our workflows are, to make the technology work for us, instead of us work for the technology. And one of my kids worked for an EMR company. And, and 
he would argue with his sister, who's a pediatrician, ironically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now about, you know, the doctors don't listen and she'd say the EMR is terrible and they'd go back and forth. And, and his point was the problem with EMR is not EMR. And this is, I think, applicable to any technology. The problem is we take our old workflows and ideas and we shoehorn them into the EMR processes. So you have, you have a hammer and a nail and you're doing this and you're used to doing that. It works okay. We gave you a pneumatic um, nail gun. You turned it on its side and you bang the nail with it and it feels clunky and it's really expensive. And that's what we've done with a lot of this technology. When we don't think about the human part of this and how we're going to use it to help people not make people adapt to the technology. Yeah. Well, it's interesting what you describe about the technology, because I think that some of what has come along with that is greater and greater specialization, right? I read an article recently that says, you know, 100, 125 years ago, most healthcare was delivered by a general practitioner in a small community. And that practitioner had a relationship with those patients. And if you imagine that practitioner having to deliver bad news to someone he had a relationship with, he would probably deliver that in a rather sensitive way. Whereas now with all the advances in medicine and science and technology has led to greater and greater specialization in care and more and more handoff between providers such that you might, you know, that, that neuroscience surgeon didn't have a relationship with your dad. And could not perhaps, you know, appreciate the significance of that. So I wonder, as, as a specialist in OBGYN, what, what do you think whether specialization has also played a role alongside with the technology? So I, I think that that is true. And you lose those longitudinal relationships to some extent. Hmm. But it also gives you the opportunity to make new connections with people. And in the moment, it's, it's odd because I love you know, the interactions I've had with patients that I've had for 30 years, and now I'm delivering babies of people that I delivered. Um, but at the same time, it's really rewarding to, as a consultant, go in and have an interaction with somebody where you can understand this part of their healthcare journey, but do it from the standpoint of help me understand you, tell me a little bit about what your priorities are, you know, what do you care about in this moment, and then give guidance to their general practitioner, family medicine doctor uh, at the same time. So I think it doesn't have to be something that is an expense of specialization or technology, but you have to be purposeful about making it not be that way. Yeah. Um, and we, I guess an example recently, and we have a small a clinic in Faribault that has three docs and had some problems with getting patients into radiology to have their ultrasound. And in OBGYN, ultrasounds are very time sensitive, like four or five days makes a big difference. So we, rather than, than thinking about how do we fix this problem, which we initially kind of went through iterations of trying to fix that, that access issue, we blew the thing up and said, if I was going to think about this from a, what do patients and providers care about? How would we do that? So not fix the problem but really invent a whole new process based on what people would want ideally. How do we optimize this world? And we ended up embedding an ultrasound tech and doing it in a way that the, the ultrasound tech does the, the procedure in our office with us there part of the time, with us discussing the results with the patient, answering questions, giving context to the tech. They, the tech loves it because they're more clinically involved. I love it because she's teaching me stuff as I'm watching her do this. The patient's getting all this information and I'm able to put all this together. And instead of a visit, a radiology visit, a phone call for results, a visit back, it's all condensed into one time. You have to change your workflows radically to do that. But it's been super cool and rewarding. And, you know, it's been financially successful. Not that that's the most important thing, but it's far more efficient. Um, our patient satisfaction scores went up and it's a great thing for us from a just efficiency of the clinic standpoint. We're not, you know, doing a lot of this technology stuff that we hate, right? In basket stuff and phone calls back or messages, all those pieces that we don't really find rewarding because it's all wrapped up at one time. Yeah. And that would seem to be a great example of what some might call kind of human centered design, right? 
let's not start with the technology and see how we can fit the humans into it, but rather start with the humans and see how we can organize technology around it. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, from, from your experience and having read your book, how do you consider what we know about human relationships and what we as humans interacting with each other need to drive those systems and those loyalty to brands to make them more meaningful? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent point and, and one that I have um, come to appreciate over the last three years that I've had the opportunity to work in healthcare. And that is, for, from my perspective, kind of something that is innately human would have application outside of healthcare, right? It wouldn't be a healthcare thing. It would be a, a thing that kind of applied everywhere. And, you know, from my e experience, um, there's a lot we can learn from the social sciences, right? And, and I had the fortunate opportunity to work with folks in social psychology who have been studying kind of what they call uh, social cognition or how we perceive and understand and make sense of one another. Um, and what they've been able to determine is that through evolution, humans became kind of hardwired to be constantly, almost subconsciously perceiving and assessing one another to determine what are their intentions towards me and what's their ability to carry out those intentions. And depending on if you, we think your intentions are good and your abilities are good, we can become really loyal and trusting of you. But if you're in your abilities are really good and we're not sure what your intentions are, which is sometimes how people perceive a medical provider, you can be very kind of distrustful and standoffish and, and not really um, want to engage in, in the advice that we're receiving. And so what I think I have recognized is that this notion of compassion and empathy and caring and all of that that is really so critical and so influential in healthcare is kind of a part of this broader human thing that's about us understanding and perceiving what are the intentions of, of these people, these care providers toward me? Are they kind of just delivering the blunt news and moving on? Or as you described in the story with your dad, are they thinking about what's in my interest? Are they asking about what matters to me and what my priorities are? Um, and that we often may make assumptions about what the patient's priorities are that may not be accurate. And so that's where I feel like there's with all the advances in biology and technology and science in, in healthcare, I think there's still more room for us to apply things that have been learned in the social sciences. And that's where I think kind of compassion and empathy and, and uh, becomes a broader human thing. It's part of this broader way that we perceive one another. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, to paraphrase a, a quote from Tom Lee, um, you know, it, the irony is that physicians assume we're compassionate and that our technical competence is a differentiator. And patients assume we're competent or they wouldn't let us do what we do. And compassion is really the differentiator. And I think COVID, for better or for worse, has accentuated that, right? There's a little bit more distrust. There are um, people are less tolerant of systems that don't work for them because they recognize that we can change things on the fly and do things a little differently. So I think it's become more important, even though that's always been true, to understand that for patients, it's about them feeling like there's a relationship and you're acting in their best interest. And at Mayo, we're really starting to focus on hope and trust. Yeah, tell us more about that. Actually, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, and in patient experience, you know, the journey really has been when the government got involved and they had the CAP surveys come out, it became, did you do something? Mm -hmm. So the questions, especially the HCAPS questions, are really focused around, did you do something all the time? And some of the, some of the answers are yes or no, right? They're binary. Um, and then loyalty surveys are more about not just did you do it, but how well did you do it? So there's a, a, some kind of a Likert scale for most of those. And as we've understood that, we want to do well on those. And, and it's not that we disregard those scales, but we're beginning to understand that there's a different way to think about this and maybe the, maybe a much deeper level that's more impactful, which is the, you know, how did you feel about how we did those things? And how do we make you feel about that? So you know, in our little ultrasound example, it's more efficient, it works better, it, it clinically is better competence wise, but for the patient, all of that's in view. And they're now interacting with the system with their provider in real time. So it gives them that security and that ability to ask questions in real time, um, which is, I think, really been really very comforting for people 
from the reinforcing that I'm trying to have a relationship with you as well as display that we're all working as a team together. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, I'd be interested in your observations about how that has impacted the, the providers that are involved in this revised process, right? We hear so much that staffing levels are really under pressure and we're short people and people are burning out and so forth. How does a process change like that impact the care providers and you know how how are they, are they benefiting from it? Well, I think it did. So specifically, that in our office did a couple of things. One is instead of getting still pictures and looking at them and and generating a report, you know, generally after the patients left, we're looking at the exam in real time, which is just better. So it's easier for me to read it. It's easier for me to ask, say, hey, I don't really like that measurement on the baby's abdomen. Let's redo that. I can do that right away. It takes 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. So it's vastly more efficient, which is a problem with, you know, our time constraints as you hear over and over and over again. And, and staffing shortages feed into that. We have more stuff to do with less time to do it and less people to do it. So we'll, we'll just have the providers or the, the person of last resort. Well, if you can eliminate a lot of that, you know, you're just, we lean the process. What's all not valued steps? Let's see if we can take those out. Um, a lot of the physicians, including myself initially, were like, oh, this is a mess. This is not going to work. It's going to do a different workflow. And, and you have to go into these ideas. And I think we have to go into this idea of how we humanize healthcare, willing to say it's going to be a mess sometimes when we do this. And I will tell you, for the first two to three weeks in this process, it was a nightmare. The scheduling was messed up. We had two people scheduled at the same time. We had the wrong doctor put in. It was just a mess. Well, we worked through that and we were committed to trying to, to make it better. And now it's it's really slick. We can do twice as many ultrasounds in the same time frame because of the process. Um, so I think that going forward, we're going to have to recognize that from a staffing standpoint, anything that's not valuable needs to come out. And that's not not valuable to the organization only that's not valuable to the person at the front line that's doing that and one of the other things we need to understand is that people really need something cool about their job to feel fulfilled at their job and it doesn't have to be every second and there's good data tate shanafelt when he was at mayo did some work on this to talk about about 20 percent. you know if 20 percent of what you do day to day you think is really interesting and, and impactful you'll live with 80% that's not so much. And the reality of everybody's job is there's a lot of stuff that's not so much, but as long as there's some that's really cool. And I love that interaction of looking at the ultrasound in real time with the patients, the patients being able to see that. We do some fun little 3D ones just to let them be able to see. It's really interesting to say, hey, does it look like your other baby? And that, that stuff's fun. And as long as I can do a little bit of that, I'm willing to put up with a lot of the other stuff. Yeah, it's remarkable. A lot of what we have observed is that both the patients and the care providers are doing their level best to connect with one another, but that sometimes it's the systems and processes, particularly with an EMR, for instance, it feels like kind of the equivalent of an American Ninja Warrior obstacle course that they're trying to navigate in order to deliver things through. And so those who might be listening and saying, gosh, how do we get a process changed in our organization? What advice or, or you know, was what were the challenges you had to overcome in order to be able to make a pilot change like this, to be able to navigate through the initial problems and be able to get a change? Is that something that is easier to do at Mayo or, or is it encouraged? Well, I think it's encouraged, but it's it's a very large organization that tends to be um, conservative, mm-hmm. um, very, very um, data driven from the standpoint of how do you know this is going to work and what data do you have that says that? So it's it's very evidence based and somewhat research based and being able to say we have this problem that we can't solve. We want to do this very differently. We're willing to, to put forth the effort. And we're willing to fail as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. So you, you got to be willing to learn as you go and fail. And, and there's a, um, one of my kids' graduations, somebody said, you know, the enemy of excellence is not failure. It's acceptance of mediocrity. And, and when we're at these inflection points in, in healthcare, I think we really are with the technology and what happened with COVID and our staffing issues. 
we have to be willing to, to try some kind of radical stuff and understand as long as it's not going to hurt anybody, it may not work, but you're going to learn things. And if it works, great. But if we learn stuff, then we can do better the next time through. So I, th I think it's that willingness to try stuff and fail. That's okay. And, and Mayo does foster that. Um, and we have a lot of really smart people. But we did this internally at a very small practice without a lot of infrastructure. You know, we have three nurses, three docs, an ultrasound tech, and one person at the front desk, one nurse practitioner. It is not a giant destination practice with a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. And it, it seems particularly in the current staffing situation that exists in many systems that, you know, that's not going to change overnight. And now may be the time more so than ever to need to adopt those process changes in order to make things more efficient and, and to kind of get the workload to, in a sustainable position right now. Right. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, you know, to speak to the staffing shortage, it, it has to be, we need to set up a system that helps people really love what they do, right? Healthcare is too difficult, especially now. It's too consequential to hate what you're doing and to, for it to be drudgery. So what things can we do to connect that? And we did a survey pre-COVID um, in Rochester at the destination practice. They talked to the Department of Surgery, Department of Medicine, two kind of very different mindsets potentially, and said, what's the thing that you like most about working at Mayo Clinic? And what came out was, I like the interaction with my peers. So if you think about the EMR and, you know, Teams meetings and instant messaging and all that, we're systematically taking that inter interaction out of our day-to-day -day work. Yeah. So I would say find ways to build that back in. If somebody sends you a consult, call them directly and say, hey, tell me more about this patient. Or I saw this patient and here's what I think. It's a three-minute phone call or even an email is okay but make a direct contact with people. Do that once a week for someone that sent you somebody and once a week to someone that you sent, especially if they're a little more complicated or there's some piece of information. Providers love that. It gives them context. It helps them with their interactions and it keeps you connected. So find ways to stay um, you know, connected to each other. When you're doing change, find ways to be connected to your core values. So at Mayo, it's the needs of the patient come first. We have other core values that are, um, you know, respect, um, integrity. There's a list of eight of them. And everybody knows those. So if you start there and say, which of these values speaks to you, Nurse Johnson? How does that juxtaposition with your work help you find meaning in your work around what your purpose is? helping you to be competent and helping you feel like you have some autonomy. And if we can get those three things right, people will want to stay because the most expensive thing we do in healthcare is turnover. Um, and people will want to come on board. And, and we're not going to just grow more people, right? And we can't throw more money at it to encourage people. And the, the new folks in coming out of training, they tell me don't care about the money anyway. Um, it's more about about that intrinsic motivation piece. So it's finding ways to do that that's going to really matter. And then you can you connect your values to that individual's priorities to my very beginning of the discussion. And when you can do that, people, I think, will be loyal and stay. I think your your brand um, analysis kind of speaks to some of that. Got it. Got it. You know, on the one hand, Mayo is consistently recognized as one of the top, you know, providers of care, not only in the country, but in the world. But I imagine there are still things that are challenges. And I wonder, you know, what are the things that, that Mayo is still focused on improving? You know, on, on one hand, you'd say with tremendous success, there may be less of a, uh, a motivation to continue to change or improve. But what are the things that, you know, still are on the radar or the target list for Mayo for improvement, would you say? Yeah, I think moving people, continuing to move people to the idea that we're improving or the initiatives for improvement are about one, improving care, two, improving your work relationship and your, and your relationship with work, and that those things go together is really key. So how do we move to that next level of employee engagement, understanding that Engaged employees provide better care. 
better care helps engage priorities, right? It's that flywheel of generating that. Um, I think we're constantly looking at that. And then doing it in a way that our data isn't, you know, nobody gets up on Monday morning and says, gosh, I got to go to work today to improve our HCAP scores. And the hospital is going to get X, extra dollars for that. Nobody, that doesn't drive anybody to try and in, um, improve things. But I'm going to go to work and I get to improve how we're doing things. I get to help people alleviate unnecessary suffering, which I think is the core of what we do in healthcare, really. Um, and I get to do it at a place where I'm connected to other people that are like-minded and those relationships matter too. Finding that ideal state and always driving towards incremental improvement. So if somebody's at the 20th percentile on some measure and you say, our goal is to be everybody be at the 90th, they look at that mountain and go too, hit, too big to climb, right? I just can't get engaged around that. But if we're saying, you know, if, if we could get you to improve to the 25th percentile or a, on the surveys, a couple of top box points over X amount of time, that would be really good work. It's going to move you forward. And we think you'll feel better about your job day to day. Let's shoot for that. And then just keep incrementally moving forward, recognizing that everybody can never be at the 90th percentile, right? That's a mathematical impossibility. So it's not only a goal that is disengaging sometimes, but it's also a goal that's not mathematically possible. So the idea of incremental improvements really helped us. And anything we do, we try and approach, at least from a patient experience and quality standpoint, from that viewpoint. Yeah. And I think it's a good example that, you know, from we talk about humanizing healthcare, it's equally important for us to humanize it for the care providers as it is for the patient. Because as humans, they have all that same needs. They're going through all the same kind of yeah. kind of subconscious judgment processes about the people around me. Are they after my best interest? And I can I rely on them to to go after me? And so it it it's all have uh deriving from the same place. Right. Yeah. yeah. Improving experience at the extent at the expense of your staff is not a long term winner. That's right. That's right. Now, I understand on a separate note that uh, there will actually be a patient experience conference coming up this fall at Mayo Clinic. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. So September 18th and 20th in Rochester, Minnesota, which um, is not that hard to get to. It's, there's a shuttle that runs from the airport in Minneapolis, which has got direct flights from everywhere. Um, we're doing a pay, our first that Mayo run patient experience conference called the New Fundamentals. So really stretch, stressing these ideas of What's the next level that we take this to that connects the patient experience, the staff experience, family and communities, and drives um, improvement and connection, most importantly, in all of those realms? Terrific. Terrific. Now, uh, why don't we take a question or two from those listening to, uh, with us today? Um, if you haven't taken the time to an an ask a question, please just use that chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and let us know what you'd like Tom to talk about with us today. Jason, there, there, uh, the dates of the conference are the 18th through 20th of September. Here you go. Okay, got it. Uh, Jason, do we have any questions from uh, listeners that we can uh, take right now? I don't, there's not currently any in the chat, but actually, Tom, if you don't mind, I actually had one um, that I'd love to ask, which is, you know, we often, when we talk about grassroots approaches, where I think about the bottom up version you know, those are always seen, those those kind of get taken back, you know, that we it needs to be top top to bottom to be successful. So I was curious with your explanation around the ultrasounds and how you guys modified that process in the smaller setting. How do you actually at Mayo permeate those ideas from those small local areas into the larger organization at Mayo? And I, I know that that's a challenge, but I'd love some commentary on that because I've not always been a believer that everything has to be top to bottom. I really believe in the grassroots, the local change, and it's always the, what is the mechanism to then feed it through to the larger organization? So several ways to do that. One is, and, and Mayo's very committed to this and has actually ramped it up. So to one of the earlier questions, you know, you need to listen to your frontline staff. So however you have mechanisms to do that, to understand where their pain points are. And then the next um, level, I think, is not to jump right to how do you want to solve that? but to ask the next question of why is that a pain point? And maybe even the next question of what concerns you about that? And um, then start thinking about what can we do to help that backing up to, do, to get to a solution. So we started with a few years ago in patient experience, asking the questions based on the big why. What's your reason for being in healthcare? What is it we're trying to accomplish? 
And then instead of saying, what's our metric? We said, well, what things can we understand better about that? What things can we do? And then how will we know we're successful? So instead of starting with, we need to, we need to move this number to this number, that, that conversation is at the very end. And it's more around how we're going to know we're successful or how do we know we need to change Ver and starting with the why. So I think understanding and listening to your frontline staff, one of our core principles in, in Office of Mayo Clinic experience, which we rebranded from patient experience, understanding that it's everybody's experience is unleashing the creative potential of our frontline staff. And you have to give them permission to experiment, right? There's some, some guardrails. But because of where we were and, and how bad the situation was, we were allowed to invent something on our own and work through the process and work through the pain points because we didn't have alternatives. I think the learnings are to be able to do that when maybe you have alternatives, but understand that they're not as good as what you can develop. Very interesting. We have a question from Ilan Geva. What is the process for choosing a specific technology since there are hundreds of new ones coming out all the time and kind of where is humanity stacked in the priority um, when making technology solution choices? So I can just speak to what we've recently done. I think, you know, there for any one problem, there's going to be myriad number of solutions and, and it'd almost be nice if there were three, right? Not a hundred. Um, and then you have to understand I think it's first, what are the priorities of the people that are going to use the technology? So a lot of EMRs, when they were put in place, I think realistically were billing systems. And the organization's priority was to make our billing better and more accurate. And those are all good, worthy goals. And then we figured out how to kind of shoehorn our care practices into that. So it probably would have been much better if we asked the providers at the front end, what if you could start from the beginning on a documentation system what things are most important to you and then we started rolling through the process that way there's probably not a substitute for doing your homework and it's basic quality improvement on your stakeholder analysis but asking the stakeholders not you know how do you solve this problem but what do you care about yeah that's great so final question we like to end every discussion with this do you have a favorite quote that you can share with us? And if so, why is it your favorite quote? Um, so I've thrown a couple of them out there. I really like thinking about this based on what's our purpose in healthcare. So, um, you know, it's, it's to alleviate unnecessary suffering, but the expansion of that quote is to cure what we can to improve what we can't cure and to provide appropriate comfort when we can't do either of those things. So I think if you always keep that in the forefront, it's, it's just in itself humanizing, right? Because what we're trying to do in, as humans and as better humans is make everybody's life, whatever that sphere of influence is for us, a little bit better. And so when people ask, you know, what do you want for your kids? A kind of common question they ask people as they get older and everything. Well, I just want my kids to be happy. I don't want my kids to be happy. I want my kids to be useful and feel like they're purposeful. And mm -hmm. I think that's what in the end makes you happy. That's right. Well, that's terrific thought to stop, to finish with Tom. We can't thank you enough for your time and insight today. It's inspiring to hear about all the new things that you are implementing at Mayo. We look forward to hearing more innovations in the future. To our listeners today, thank you for joining us as well. We hope you found our discussion informative and expiring. We'll be posting a recording of today's program on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And be sure to join us for our next Humanizing Healthcare discussion on Tuesday, June 13th at 1 p.m. We'll be talking with Greg McCool, Chief Transformation Officer at NRC Health, about how their focus on human understanding is helping to humanize healthcare for patients and care providers that they serve. In the meantime, we would welcome your feedback, questions, and suggestions related to humanizing healthcare. You can simply email them to us at info at Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. Have a terrific day. And thanks again, Tom. Bye-bye.